Here in the last uh, section here of module two, we're gonna uh, talk about urbanization and immigration. Uh, industry that we talked about, all these new industries have created tons of jobs. These people are flocking um, to America, but not just to America, they're flocking into the cities during this time period from about 1870 to the early 1900s. And that's really where we're gonna focus on. Um, we do wanna return to a couple things from the last, um, Lectures, you know, because we did talk about, you know, how uh, rich Rockefeller and Carnegie were. Um, I told you that guy from uh, the guy, the Mansa Musa, the guy who's like the number one guy. I forgot to, he's like, he was worth like $500 billion at his time. He was really expensive. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah. And so um, the urban frontier. It's not frozen, right? I feel like every time I do this, it's frozen. So in 1860, um, there were zero American cities with one million people living in them. 30 years later, at the heart of the Gilded Age, however, uh, Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia, all three had over a million people. Um, New York was actually second in the Western world only to London, uh, with about three and a half million people. Now, in 1890, there was three and a half million people living in New York City. Today, there's only about six or seven million living there. The reason for that is they started going up, but it's not a very big place, right? Like, it's really not a very big area. Um, the population can only grow to so much, um, but, um, you know, it, it, it definitely is seeing a huge growth in uh, these urban areas. Um, what's, what's causing this to grow in leaps and bounds? Skyscrapers. Basically, that's the number one reason. You can only gain higher populations if you can go up in structure. And that's really going to allow them to do that. Um, at this point, that these cities start trying to compete for who can actually have the tallest um, structure in the world, right? Um, for the, there was a time there where Chicago uh, had a 269 foot tall auditorium building, uh, and then New York builds one that's 309 feet, and uh, then the next year, Philadelphia builds one that's 300. 30 feet, and so then they start working up and up and up and up and up, and you start to see these development of um, like these big giant skylines of cities, and it's really pretty, uh, except all the industry means like there's the air is so bad you can't even see the tops of the buildings in most of these places because it's dirty and nasty and disgusting, and you can barely breathe, and it's full of smoke. Um, obviously, the, this race to the sky kind of culminates with uh, the Empire State Building, which ends up being like the t tallest building because they put like a flagpole on top of it that made it like three feet taller uh, than the one in Chicago. Uh, what's that one? Um, what's the name of that building in Chicago? Sears Tower or whatever it is in Chicago. I think that's in Seattle. That's the Space Needle. Now, there is a uh, CD underbelly of um, this movement, however, though, and, and we're going to kind of talk about that. Um, one is how people are being treated, particularly, particularly workers, immigrants, and children, even. Uh, also, working conditions, they're going to be really, really bad. Um, and that's really what we're going to talk about here. One example is like Irish and Chinese workers. Uh, here you can see um, Irish and Chinese people working on the railroad. I've been working on the railroad um, all the live long day. So um, yeah, lots of Chinese people built railroads. Um, and we talked about that with the railroad, how they worked and met with the Transcontinental Railroad and that the Chinese and the Irish were particularly the ones doing that. 
But even though they were the ones building everything, everybody looked down on them, like really discriminated against the Chinese and the uh, Irish. You also have child labor, which is even more troubling if you really think about it. And uh, one of the primary sources that you're going to read is actually like um, pictures and stuff like that of like kids working in factories and, and talking about kids working. Um, and, and it's kind of crazy because there's like pictures of kids like in textile factories climbing on the machines and like um, kids – they were really good to use in factories, especially because like the machines had like tiny little parts. And so the kids would like crawl up into the machines and like fix stuff and then hope that they got out in time before the guy shut the machine back on. Cause sometimes they didn't like a lot of times. Um, there was quite many, many, many examples of kids like working in steel factories because you know that big uh, blast furnace Bessemer process thing that you, I sh showed you, like that big hole, the thing where the steel is all melted in? Well, all those uh, impurities that kind of boil and come out of the steel, they like cake on to the sides of the inside of those. And so you have to clean those out. And so like um, you, there's a little door down there and you open the door and you go inside and you have to like scrape it out from the inside. Well, you got to be tiny. So they used kids for that. And... Um, they would do this at night because during the day, all the adults were there working in the factory. So you had little six, seven, eight, nine year old kids climbing inside of industrial machines at night. And then sometimes they'd fall asleep. And then the next day the factory would come in and they'd turn it on and pour molten hot lava steel on top of their heads inside those buckets. So, you know, um, yeah, it was a really, it was really sad. Abundance of cheap labor, uh, both native born and immigrants. Um, now the point that we're trying to make here is ch child labor bad, right? Um, and, but we're trying to understand what is happening with these families because they feel like if they don't put their children to work, they're not going to have enough money to live. Um, and so, you know, obviously we disagree with child labor today, but still um, it's done all over the globe. I mean, without a doubt, there's child laborers making your Nikes. Child laborers making your Nikes. And slaves in China are making your Nikes. So there you go. Um, yeah. They're still pretty expensive. Yeah, for sure. Especially if you use slaves who you don't have to pay. Yeah. No, the Uyghurs. Yeah. The Chinese Muslims. They arrest them because they don't like Muslims there, and they arrest them and put them in camps and make them work for free, building clothes and stuff like that. Like, quite literally, slaves. Wow. Okay. Um, now, we talked about the origins of this a little bit. Um, abundance of cheap labor, but realistically, um, a lot of these families that had lived in the United States for several generations, these are not the ones whose kids are working in factories. It's the immigrants uh, that are coming from Europe, right? Um, and so they're... These people are fresh off the boat coming from Europe or from China, and you have these Italian immigrants, and they are producing, they're coming to get better land and better opportunity for their lives, and it's going to end up being a very brutal life uh, for them in a lot of cases. Now, this chart you can see here tells us a lot of things, so kind of just look at this just for a second. In the 1870s, the vast majority of immigrants are coming from northwestern Europe, what we would call old world immigrants. And these are two key terms you need to remember, old world and new world. These are old world immigrants, meaning that they're coming from countries that, you know, those countries had been in North America for a long time. You know, they had colonized and set up there, and these immigrants have been coming from a long time. Great Britain, Ireland, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Netherlands, Scandinavia, and also Central Europe. 
you see this, the blue and the red here. Germany, Poland, Czech, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Austria, Hungary, right? So these companies, or these countries, are where most immigrants are coming from, from Europe. Until you get to about 1890. And then it's still about the same, but you see there starts to be a rise from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. Then by 1900, it's really taking over. And then 1910, there are more Eastern and Southern Europeans. And then by the 1920s, it's almost double all the others is Southern Europeans. Uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, right? It's really important to understand that these people are coming over in a different, they have different understandings of what life should be like. They don't have that old European um, understanding of government or worker conditions or anything like that. They're coming over because their countries are war-torn. They have nothing. They're coming to escape poverty, and they'll work for 10 cents a day, Okay. Their working conditions uh, and their living conditions um, were, you know, there's a lot of things under that. And, but for the most part, the work itself is very repetitive, very rhythmic. I told you, you know, you just zip, 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 right? And then you go to the next thing, zip, 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 zip. And then the next one comes, zip, 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 zip. And then the next one, and you're just like, oh, zip, 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 zip. And then you just fall asleep. And you're like, all right, turn this crank. Now what? Turn the crank again. Oh. Okay. Now what? Turn the crank again. Oh. Okay. It's like, you're going to pay me for this? Yeah. It's like, this was easy. Congratulations, you're fully trained. Well, what happens if something breaks? Uh, you just turn that crank, buddy. Does your job. Um, very, very, very uh, required no skills at all. Um, very dangerous because they don't know anything. They're not skilled. They can't fix it. You know what I mean? Like, even if you didn't know what the heck you were doing, if your job, like, your little, your zip, 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 right? And then you go zip, 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 and you're like, oh, I can't zip, zip. And then you... Then you try and fix it, and you electrocute yourself because you don't know what the crap you're doing, right? That happens a lot, too. Or, like, you train some dude in three minutes to be like, hey, you're going to take this chain, and you're going to run it through here, and then you're going to hook the chain just like this, and then you're going to slide it across this thing. But make sure you hook that chain good because otherwise this is going to fall from the sky and crush G Jim down there, right? And you're like... Take chain, you put the chain, you do hook it like that. Is there any other special requirements? Like, no, you just get that chain hooked, and now you know how to do your job. And you're like, okay. And then you get tired after eight hours of hooking that chain, and then like you're like, uh, uh, you just kind of halfway hook it, and then Jim's dead. Well, maybe you should have been trained how to do it right or have some safety. Um, also, the pollutants, like, they had no, like, regulations on, like, anything. You know, like, a lot of these, like, uh, textile mills or whatever and, and, like, tanneries and things that they used to make some of these products had terrible acids and chemicals and you'd mix them together and you're not wearing gloves and you're just breathing this stuff in and, like, I mean, you're talking about people just dying, like, really bad. Also, you know... There's no safety laws. There's no workers' compensation. There's no pension. There's no retirement. You show up to work or you don't get paid. And if you don't show up to work two days in a row, you're fired. There's no bathroom breaks. You get 10 minutes for lunch. Yeah, you don't have time for that. You don't like it? Get another job. Right? There's no bathroom break. There's, there's no, like, oh, hey, uh, sorry, Jim. Uh, we know you uh, you were trying to fix that machine, and we accidentally turned it back on too fast, and now you don't have an arm, but um, are you going to be at work on Monday? Because otherwise, we're going to have to let you go. Also, those look like some expensive doctor bills. Hope you can figure it out. <laughs> They're like, but you turned it on. My arm is still in there, and now I just got these. 
How am I supposed to go zoop, 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 zoop? I can't hold the zoop, zooper. And they're like, too bad, sorry, you're fired. I'm like, aren't you gonna pay me like for anything? No, I only pay people that work and you can't work, sorry buddy. Right, and then you're in trouble. Yeah, so that happened a lot. Uh, also, they'd just like walk in and be like, oh yeah, hey guys, uh, people didn't buy enough of our stuff last week, so we're gonna have to fire 50 of you, just uh, all y'all, bye. Maybe we'll need you next week. Just come back and check, you know. Uh, pretty crazy. Uh, very appalling conditions. And to think that this is all also done with, like, children. Yeah, not good. Uh, you had children, like, working down in coal mines. Like, literally. I mean, it's it's awful. Uh, yeah, no insurance. Right? No Aflac. Um, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, no Aflac. Uh, and, again, these people are flocking to cities from overseas, from the countryside. The cities are overflowing just basically, boom, just like that. And also, the cities grow so fast, they can't take care of all the people that are there. I mean, you think, like, you don't have plumbing for all these people. You don't have houses for them to live in. You don't have food for them to eat. You don't have any of this stuff. But they're here. And you got to figure it out, right? Um, crime is going to become awful, awful crime. Fire, really dangerous because most of the houses that house all these workers, they just kind of build like these wooden like shack skyscrapers, like literally. Um, there's plumbing issues. There's it, it's there. People are living in rooms that are like. 10 by 10 and they got like eight people in there and and no bathroom and no windows and children are being raised without ever seeing sunlight and i mean it's 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 really bad uh you know you poop in a bucket and you throw it out in the street and people are just walking through poop um major disease everywhere public transportation you know is not going to work um and so that's not, it's just really bad. Um, this chart kind of shows the percent of people who lived in the countryside versus the cities. In 1800, about 95% of people lived in the country. They were rural. By the 1900s, it was almost like 60-40. Now, in 2000, it was like, it's like 2080, okay? And it's pretty much stayed right there. Um, but it, it became... Very, very, very interesting to see how those numbers shifted. So all this basically means is that you end up with these places like slums, okay? Uh, they are slums. Tenements is what they call them, but they're slums. Um, the English poet uh, William Blake referred to factories in the surrounding areas as satanic mills. Um, and people were like, basically, that's where the devil is created. Um, and so, you know, it, it's really, really awful. It's rat infested. They called these dumbbell tenements. Uh, if you look at it, like you had, this is like uh, one apartment, two apartment, three apartment, four apartment. Okay. Um, and you had a bedroom, living room, parlor, a bedroom, bedroom, living room, parlor, and one giant long hall. And then one shared bathroom, maybe, and it was disgusting, no windows, no, the fire escapes didn't work. The only way to get out was at each end, and usually the fire escapes were broken. Uh, crime flourished. People lived in unsanitary conditions. Um, yeah, it was, it was awful. Yeah. I mean, you, you can see, like, this is a picture of, like, an apartment apartment that has like eight people living in it and they're you're standing at the door to the apartment and this is it that's the whole thing um it's pretty awful um what ends up happening landlords take full advantage of the influx of cheap labor they start building cheap houses tenements uh really shabby construction wooden buildings that house multiple families in these tiny apartments no running water no sanitation um, disease, things would just collapse. People would be in their homes and the whole thing would just fall down. Um, 
wooden buildings catching on fire with like hundreds of people in them, no way to escape. People would just died. Uh, pollution, soot, filth covering every surface. Um, yeah, it was just crazy. The living conditions are appalling. Uh, it, it, you can't understate it. It's, it's pretty bad. If you saw anything like this today, it would be on Twitter and Snapchat so fast, and there would be people protesting outside these buildings in a heartbeat if anything like this was allowed to happen today. But back then, they were just like, hey, you know, if you don't like it, then you can go back out to the countryside and farm a little. You know, you don't have to work here. You don't have to live here. It's your choice, you know, which I guess they're kind of right. Uh, Jacob Reese does, uh, he does this thing where he goes and he takes a bunch of photographs and he puts them into a book and he publishes it in 1892 after one year of traveling. And he basically says, this is the hard facts of, you know, this is what people are doing. And it really tugged at the heartstrings of people that didn't really truly understand how bad it was for the poor. Um, he had pictures in there, like there was 12 adults living in a room that was 13 by 13. Yeah, 12 adults in a room that was 13 by 13. Yeah, um, which is kind of crazy. This room is like 25, 30 by 30. So imagine like a quarter of this room and 12 of you living there full time. So... Eventually, uh, laws do end up getting passed that eliminate building of tenements out of wood, which basically, you know, at least they won't burn down with you inside of it. Not like immediately, not the whole thing. Or, and, um, and you, you know, you have to space them out more and all this stuff. And it, they certainly don't figure out public housing by any means. I mean, it's still very awful, but, you know, when he makes this book, the, the phrase, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words really does come true because people can see it. You know, you, I can tell you about it all you want, but when you see it, it's, it becomes very real. Um, by the 1930s, uh, you get a lot of legislation be, that is, a, you know, that says, hey, you can't treat people like this. You, have to, you can't have tenements with no windows and no bathrooms, no electricity and no anything that are gonna fall down. like So you do end up having quite a bit of legislation that changes things uh, in that regard, which is nice, I guess. You also have uh, unions, huh? Yeah, you also have unions start to show up um, that are basically going to champion uh, workers' rights, primarily the eight-hour workday. Um, they also say like, hey, no convict labor, you know, and all of this stuff, they want uh, competition for labor and competition for jobs. Um, they want immigrant restrictions um, for, you know, skilled labor positions, uh, blacksmiths or welders or whatever. They want, um, you know, liabilities for injury. If you get hurt on the job, your job should have to pay you for it. All of these are things that are pretty straightforward. Um, but Samuel Gompers, he creates the American Federation of Labor, uh, and he is really one of the leaders on some of this stuff. It doesn't work out all that well uh, at the beginning, but people start realizing, like, we have to take care of ourselves to some extent. You also have the Knights of Labor. Um, that is another group. They're founded by Uriah Stevens. They want equal pay, no child labor, cooperative ownership. They want an income tax. Again, immigrant restrictions. And actually, some of them, uh, their efforts lead to the Chinese Exclusion Act. Okay. Um, and that's, that's a really big thing uh, that's going to come out of this as well. Here's really what they're looking for, uh, for the most part, some of these things that they're looking for, um, as we talked about. Um, but basically, the rich people don't want to pay them anything. Because why would you? If you can get away with not paying them, you want to make all this money. I mean... You have these guys making hundreds of billions of dollars, and they're like, ah, 10 cents a day sounds right for you. Right? And there's nobody pushing back, and eventually these labor unions are going to push back. One of these, if, one of these things um, was called the Haymarket Affair. It was very violent. It really hurt unions because of how violent it got. Um, 
this summer, a bunch of different labor groups got together and they're talking about starting a nationwide movement to start the eight hour workday uh, idea. And um, they also wanted to celebrate labor in a day called Labor Day, uh, which we now have in uh, September, but they wanted it to be May 1st. And the new idea, uh, it wasn't new, it wasn't a new idea to do some of these things, but um, basically they get together and they're going to uh, put a demonstration together. So they planned this event over a couple years from 1884 to 1886. May 1st of 1886, they had this huge peaceful march. Uh, and like, they're hoping that like 80,000 workers are going to show up and march and say, hey, we want eight hour workday. Really, they only have about 35,000 show up. But still, 35,000 people show up. They're going to march and show how, they, how much they all stand together. Well, uh, the cops show up and break them up. And they go, oh, hey, you can't do this. So, um, then they're like, fine, they disperse. The next day they get back together and they're going to have another march at uh, Haymarket Square, to Haymarket Square. And um, basically, in the course of this march, the, P the uh, police show up, they start shooting people with rifles. They're like, you can't only work eight hours and shoot them, which is crazy. Like, if you think about it, like, they're shooting protesters because they don't want to work. 12 hour days for a dollar. Um, start shooting people, and then somebody threw a stick of dynamite at the police, and it exploded and killed seven policemen and four workers. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And so basically, um, the problem is, is that now. One of the people that they arrest, they put eight people on trial. Uh, five of them are hung. One of them commits suicide before they can be hung. Um, and one of these uh, people that they arrested for throwing the dynamite was an anarchist who had a Knights of Labor card in his back pocket. So then all of a sudden, it gives the newspapers and big businessmen the ability to be like, see, if you join a union, you're supporting terrorists. And so then the unions really kind of start to fall apart there. Um, and they start thinking about them as like, you know, uh, in a bad light for sure. Um, we also end up during this time with the idea of nativism, the idea that, hey, uh, it really anti-foreignism. Uh, these people from Southern and Eastern Europe, people are afraid like, hey, that's not people we're used to. And they're going to come here and they're going to outbreed us and then take over. Like, what? Okay, you're freaking crazy, people. Um, they also bring dangerous ideas like socialism and communism, and they don't want anything to do with that. So in 1882, Congress says, hey, if you're a criminal or if you can't prove that you have a job or that you're coming here to work, we're not going to let you in. Um, and they also prohibited worker, like if, if a company goes to like Europe and is like, hey, you 50 guys, how much do you make in a year? And they're like, $10. And they're like, cool, I'll pay you 50 cents a day to come work for me. Well, you're basically recruiting people that'll work for nothing because it's more than what they have. And then, so the Congress says, you can't do that anymore. And then eventually we get the old Statue of Liberty from France as a gift, uh, which is kind of opposite of what we were kind of standing for at the time. Yeah, I'm almost done. Grover Cleveland, he was president. He actually uh, said, it is said that the quality of recent immigration is undesirable. The time is quite within recent memory that the same thing was said of immigrants who, with their descendants, are now numbered among our best citizens. So he's kind of pushing back on that, right? He's saying, like, hey, uh, in case y'all forgot, uh, like, y'all were immigrants. And now y'all don't want any more immigrants? Like, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, but we're the good immigrants. We're already here, America, right? And so there was a lot of uh, dispute over that. And lastly here, industrialization's benefits and costs. Benefits, rise in national power and wealth, improving the standard of living. Human cost, though, you know, exploitation, no big deal. Social unrest, eh. Growing disparity between the rich and the poor. Eh, who cares? Right? Obviously, I'm being a little uh, 
sarcastic. And also the increase of, of giant corporations. You also have air quality, pollution, deforestation, major wealth gaps, migration to cities, repetitive work, alienation, crime, poor nutrition, disease, child labor, and generally poor people being treated like crap. Hey, but you know, Rockefeller got that paper, so I guess it works out. This is all going to lead us into the next era of American history, which is the progressive era, where we're actually going to combat some of these things and try and push back against them and fight against them. So, there you go.